So, according to this book, there's a microverse that's smaller than us that we don't know about. Can, does that mean that we could be a microverse without knowing it? And what if that universe is another microverse? And what if that universe is a microverse? What if we're all smaller than... God? My brain! Hello, Internet. Welcome to Tales to Showcase, where we pawn off our kid at the drop of an ant. I'm your host, the Watcher of New Earth. Well, kids, today we're in for a treat. It's time for a team-up book. Marvel 2-in-1, as the title suggests, was a team-up book that paired up heroes. It started the thing from the Fantastic Four and a new team-up every issue. This issue was written by Tom DeFalco, an editor-slash-writer at Marvel, with art by Ron Wilson, who's best known for chronicling the thing's adventures through the 70s and 80s. In this issue, our ever-loving thing is joined by the astonishing Ant-Man. How does the crossover hold up? Well, let's find out. This is Marvel 2-in-1, number 87. Our story begins in the Baxter building, as Ben Grimm is helping Reed out with an experiment to see if he can make an object change its density. Big deal. Why don't you invent something practical for once? Like a city bus that runs on time. Speaking from experience, I know that Ben's idea would help more people. The experiment seems to be working as the ball gets steadily heavier. Ben is able to just barely maintain his grip on the ball, but the floor begins to crack under the combined weight. To turn this Bing Blame thing off! Being blamed? Comic books trying to swear, everyone. With the experiment over, Ben begins complaining about how he always has to be Reed's guinea pig. As he belly aches, however, he begins to glow. My body feels strange, all tingly. Becoming radioactive! <laughs> Actually, Ben is shrinking, and soon he disappears completely. Reed and the Human Torch quickly mark where he disappeared and come to the conclusion that he must have been shrunk into a subatomic world. They recall a time when something similar happened to them, and how they were able to escape with the help of Dr. Henry Pym, the original Ant-Man. Unfortunately, we won't be able to rely on Dr. Pym's help this time. As you know, he gave up being the Ant-Man years ago and took up the identity of Yellow Jacket, but recently he suffered a severe mental breakdown. And rumor has it that he's turned to crime. Jeez, Reed, you're such a gossip! Although Reed and Johnny lament that they are unable to contact the new Ant-Man, an ant on the windowsill overhears them and begins relaying a message to other ants in the hopes of contacting Ant-Man. Soon, at the suburban Long Island home of electronics technician Scott Lang, where the hedges haven't been trimmed in weeks and the lawn could stand a good mowing. Wow! First Reed gossiping about Hank turning to crime, and now the narrator dissing on Scott for his housekeeping skills? What's with all the Ant-Man hate? These people are heroes too! Inside the unkept Lang household, Scott is scolding his daughter Cassie for the mess in her room. I, on the other hand, am distracted by the Darth Vader poster and the R2-D2 on the floor. Looks like Scott really did see that old movie. <laughs> what, I had this kind of setup and I wasn't supposed to make a Civil War offense? Get out of here. Scott tells her to clean up her room, but she complains that she needs to meet her friends at the movies. Scott, however, won't have it and tells her to start cleaning. Aw, such good parenting. Just then, Cassie notices a bunch of ants entering through the window. Scott quickly assumes the worst and ushers Cassie out, telling her to go meet her friends. Aww, such terrible parenting. Scott quickly gets dressed in his superhero garb, but before he heads out, he calls his sister Ruth to babysit Cassie in case he takes too long. What? You didn't know Scott had a sister? Actually, come to think of it, I didn't know Scott had a sister. You know, a character's really underutilized if I don't know that they exist. Phew. I wonder how many other superheroes are also single parents. Well, there was your fellow redhead Roy Harper. Then Cry for Justice happened and DC killed off his daughter and took away his arm. Not cool. Scott wraps up some pointless exposition and shrinks down to join the ants and is on his way. Back at the Baxter building, Reed and Johnny are still stressing about Ben. However, Johnny seems dead set on giving up on him. Face it, Reed, no one can help Ben now. Look, all I'm saying is that we sell all this stuff and turn his room to a bowling alley. Suddenly, Scott appears behind Johnny, prompting him to ask how Scott got in the building. It's easy when you're ant size. And being an ex-burglar doesn't hurt. That being said, I stole a few of your things on my way up here. I hope that's not a problem. Reed, now having someone who could save his best friend, quickly cuts to the chase, right? Nope. Instead, he brings up Hank Pym again and how he's wanted by the authorities. Scott quickly changes the subject, and Reed quickly gives a synopsis and says that if Scott shrinks down while in ant form, he should be able to enter the microworld. The science sounds right. Science is so amazing! Scott tries it, and sure enough, he shrinks to a molecular level and suddenly lands in a medieval-esque hallway. So... 
is this what would have happened to Scott if he kept shrinking in the movie? Is Janet stuck in a castle? Before Scott can get his bearings, he is attacked by some guards, but he's able to shrink down and defeat them. After losing the guards, he makes his way to a door. I pray I'm not too late to help Ben Grimm. They could be torturing him. Or worse. They could be putting him in a horrible movie where he can't wear pants! But as Scott opens the door, he finds the thing sitting comfortably and being fed. Before either of them can figure out what's going on, they are approached by... <laughs> <laughs> What are you wearing, lady? Let's analyze this a little, shall we? What is it? It can't be armor. If it were armor, I don't know about the rest of you, but I can see a few weaknesses. Is it just metallic for the sake of being metallic? Now, how about the chest plate, or would they be breastplates? I'm inclined to think that they would be called breastplates because that's all they cover. And are they attached to her like a necklace? Because, I mean, that's the only way they can be attached, right? <sighs> well... At least it's not just revealing a starfire from Red Hood and the Outlaws. And what's with the little curtain between her legs? Does she not have any metal garb on her crotch? Anyways, moving right along. This is Perla, the monarch of the microworld. Hmm, catchy. Turns out that Perla is at conflict with a species of lizard warriors, particularly their leader Zorak, who swore to destroy her kingdom if she could not produce a champion to defeat him in combat. He also swore to take her as his bride. Yep. I know that when I go for a girl, I always open with the old threaten to destroy your home line. Also, why is it that every alien race in media is attracted to humans? Are we just the most attractive race? Actually, when you consider that people like Chris Evans and Daisy Ridley exist, it's hard to argue that we're not. She goes on to say that Ben has volunteered to be her champion, and now being at ease, Scott lets himself be taken to rest. However, once they reach the room, it becomes clear that it's meant to be a cell. However, it seems that they've given him a huge TV, which makes Scott so happy that he decides to recreate the bullet dodging scene from The Matrix. Seriously, what is up with this pose? Scott quickly realizes that the device is meant to monitor him and dismantles it. The guards rush to the cell, but Scott is shrunken down and hitches a ride in a guard's boot. Was getting the boot necessary? I feel like you could have followed them on foot just as easily. Back with Perla, it's revealed that the fruit that Ben has been eating is putting him into a hypnotic state, meaning that he'll probably lose to Lizard Boy. Perla clearly knows this, but doesn't care, as she plans to perform an air raid on the Lizard's home during the contest. So, let me get this straight. Instead of attacking them when they're all in their homeland, you decide to lure away their leader and a bunch of other lizards, and then attack. Congratulations, lady! You've reached Loki levels of stupid! Scott overhears and quickly sends out a signal for help, which is answered by the native bugs. Back with the thing, he enters the arena, but is quickly beaten by Zorak due to his stunted senses. However, Scott soon reaches him and distracts Zorak with other bugs. He then gives Ben an electric shock, which snaps him out of it. Ben then quickly turns the fight in his favor and throws Zorak at Perla's seat, which makes a loud crunch. Well, Perla's dead. That was easy. Anyone for tacos? Actually, no. Perla slipped away in the confusion and plans to launch her airstrike. Ben and Scott catch up, however, and put a quick end to her plans. And our comic ends with Ben and Scott forcing the two to sign a peace treaty, even though they know that it's not going to have any lasting effect. And that was Marvel 2-in-1, number 87. It was just okay. Well, by no means a terrible book, it doesn't really bring anything new to the characters, and the story's... Okay, as long as you don't really think about how stupid the plan is, and the art is decent. Good for the most part, but a little dodgy in some places. At the end of the day, it's a harmless, goofy little read, and if you got 20 minutes to kill, I say go ahead and pick it up. Anyways, thanks for joining me, and I'll see you next time. This is the Watcher of New Earth, signing off.